Yeah, I'm Goddard. Um, Matt is my research advisor. And uh, I work in a crystallography lab. We write software for crystallographers. We make lots of tools. Um, we work on something called CCTDX, which is an open source toolbox for writing this software, as well as Phoenix, which is a tool that uh, is pretty widely used among crystallographers to uh, process X-ray data and turn it into a protein. Um, so a bit, little bit of background on crystallography. Um, it gives you a really high resolution structure of protein images, uh, proteins, which uh, is really useful. You can use that to find, find out the function of a protein. Um, you can use it to uh, figure out which parts of the protein are knocked out, to design drugs to fit into the protein. But unfortunately, it's a really complicated process. It's been used to some cool effects. On the left, you have the diffraction uh, the pattern of uh, DNA fiber, which helps solve the structure way back in the 1950s, uh, as well as a modern day paper where they, uh, they target a, uh, a chemical uh, block that connects the process. This is with the structure they built to do this. Crystallography is a really big field. They have uh, currently around 80,000 structures, <coughs> structures in the protein data bank, and it grows every single year. And among these, there are lots of ions, which are tiny little metals that will co-crystallize with your protein and bind to some site on the protein. Um, uh, but we have this problem. Um, going from X-ray data to a model is a really time-consuming process. You can overfit it, you can misinterpret it, uh, and it's not a very automated thing. So our lab focuses on making tools to make this easier, automatic, and more correct. So we try and bring uh, really well-tested tools to the field. Uh, so the process of X-ray crystallography follows this general diagram. You have, uh, you crystallize your protein, which involves putting it in a solution where it will very slowly uh, go from liquid to solid phase into a structured structure crystal, you shoot x-rays at it, and you get out a uh, diffraction pattern, as you see this here. You have a diffraction pattern, which are a bunch of spots. Uh, and through a bunch of really complicated math, you're able to generate a map which uh, looks something like this, where it's a bunch of blobs that correspond with where the, the atoms in the structure are. Uh, from there, you will create a protein model, which involves placing uh, placing what you believe are atoms, as well as the connected bit figuring out what the connectivity between those atoms are. And then find that you take that initial structure and you find it, which involves uh, kind of adjusting the positions um, to fit better, uh, to have more correct chemistries, and validate it against uh, certain metrics, such as what is physically possible versus impossible. Uh, so our lab uh, has one big project called Phoenix Refine, which uh, is that goes over this step here, as well as a few other things that are trying to make this process of going from data to model completely on time. And so I've been working on two tools, I'm picking and I'm validation, uh, with the end goal of being able to do, run one command to Phoenix start to finish on a data file and generate a model. So among the things that our lab is currently working on, I am on this little block here. So ion picking uh, is the process of looking at one of the blobs in that data, in the map that I showed you before, and being able to figure out what is its identity. Is it water? Is it zinc? Is it chloride? Is it manganese? Uh, and this is a kind of minor problem, but it's pretty widespread among protein structures. There's uh, a lot of incorrect structures out there. Um, the problem is figuring out what should go into what blob is kind of Difficult. It requires a lot of specific knowledge and a kind of like rules based on patterns seen previously in the in protein models. So you have something like iron will only bind to cysteine, to aspartate, to glutamate, to histidine, which are rules that most people aren't going to remember and you can't really expect them because a lot of to know. So we, I started by looking at all the features of these sites that we could measure. We can measure what is coordinating. There are sulfur atoms. Uh, there are oxygen atoms at this distance. Uh, they are coordinated in a tetrahedral shape, in an octahedral shape. Uh, and I just, uh, I started just 
by measuring all of these features and correlating them with what their metal identity is. Uh, you can also look at the map itself. You can see uh, how dense the, the electron clock, the map is at a certain site. If, it's, uh, if it has a really high peak, then that probably corresponds with the heavy atoms, such as calcium and things that are higher up in the periodic table. You can look at the shape, and you can also compare, you can generate something called a distance map, or a difference map, which compares your model to data. And if it's <coughs> the discrepancy, the discrepancy it'll show you. Another thing we could do was uh, look at the distances between the atoms and, uh, between coordinating atoms and the metal itself, and you can correlate that with uh, the, the, the chemistry of the site. So, uh, through a simple mathematical formula, you can, you can turn those distances into what you should, a value that you should expect equal to the charge. If it isn't, then you can rule out, uh, then you can potentially rule out the metal identity at that site. And this is kind of, it's dependent on how well your model is currently built, so we have a little, a second value which controls for your accuracy. And so we get a bunch of numbers. Uh, but these don't tell us what a site is. We have a bunch of values, um, turning those into one final identity. That's a classification problem. That's a well-studied math problem uh, that has many different approaches. Uh, my fall and spring project was to just kind of create kind of loosey-goosey rules that say, like, if it's between these numbers, which kind of arbitrarily picked, then it's some metal. Problem was, and that created like a decision uh, tree. So um, the problem was, the cutoffs were arbitrary, and it didn't really give very good sensitivity. It didn't give many false, false positives, but lots of false negatives. It missed stuff, and it couldn't tell the difference between different levels. So uh, I started looking at machine learning algorithms, which are processes to automatically uh, find the optimal classifier. So I looked through a bunch, and I found one that seemed pretty useful for our needs called the uh, support vector machines. Uh, they work by feeding a training set of structures. You tell them, here's a bunch of examples that uh, you can work with. It plots them in uh, a really high dimensional space, and then tries to find the lines that divide up that space. Uh, and that's a big math problem, but there are computer libraries to do that automatically. And so from that, you get a classifier that you can feed in something, a new, new site that is of unknown identity, and it will classify it for you. Problem was, um, as I mentioned earlier, the protein data bank is full of, um, there's stuff that's incorrect, stuff that's tentatively assigned, stuff that has more than one metal at one site. Um, and unfortunately, I went through and had to collect about, so far, 500 structures um, with more on the way that we'll be looking for in the fall um, to document and document where they are correct and incorrect so we can come up with a higher uh, higher quality of training set and make that a set. But after all that was done, we had results. Uh, our classifier was able, was really, really strong at telling, a telling the difference between a metal and water. So there's some statistics here. This is this false positive and negative rate. And here's before we had kind of low values for sensitivity and specificity. And uh, for almost everything except calcium, which is currently still a work in progress, we had really, really good uh, identification rates. Additionally, our tool can now di differentiate different ions. And while there are some that look really similar because they're really chemically similar, um, such as zinc, nickel, and iron all look pretty similar. Um, manganese and calcium, and this kind of cluster of these three were uh, pretty good at separ we were pretty good at separating uh, between the three. Uh, and these are kind of numbers that say if you have some metal that is one of these two, this is the chance that your guess will be, that the tool's guess will be correct. Um, as a separate thing, I came up with, I wrote three tools, one to validate, uh, to look at a structure and validate what's there, another to look at a structure and correct what is built in it, and one that will uh, 
for crystallographers doing high speed throughput screening, it would, uh, based on what well your protein crystallized in from standard trace, it would generate an element list to narrow down the search field. So all these are pretty useful tools for other crystallographers, especially large structural genome projects, which do their best just to generate as many structures as possible. So we made a tool. It's useful. Um, and I'm looking forward to the, the day when I start getting bug reports from other crystallographers. Um, and I uh, documented it and provided methodologies so that we can add support for more metals. Currently, we just support the most common ones. Uh, and it's, mo it's modular. And already, some parts of it are being used in other parts of the new project. So yeah, uh, I'd like to thank all of CCI, this is my the PI of the lab, my personal advisor, as well as other people who contributed code and advice for my project. Along with Susan Marcusi, uh, who is my ed, uh, research advisor on campus, these people are all over at LDL, and the CERT research program is like, uh, yeah, they all made it possible and we really appreciate that.